Meet my family. Well, actually, this is only part of my family. My mum was one of six, my dad is one of seven. This is just my dad's side of the family. And like most families, sadly, we don't see each other often enough. That's not helped by the fact that 25 years ago, I decided to follow my dream, move from my home country in Belgium and move to the UK and live here. There's a few things, however, that have kept me connected to this tribe of a family. First is technology. I am so grateful for social media. Yes, you heard it right. I am grateful for social media. My aunts, my uncles, my cousins have given in to living out loud on social media, sharing with me my, their stories, their events, and even some of their dramas. But technology is never quite enough. It's good for maintaining relationships, maybe not so good at building relationships. The second thing, however, that keeps me connected to this family tribe is a family tradition that has been passed down three generations. Early September, every second year, we come together for a family get-together, which is where these photos were taken. I look forward to these events. They recharge me, they reboot me, with all the love, hugs, kisses, stories told on that one day every two years. You know that feeling, that feeling of feeling connected, of feeling held, that feeling of being bathed in so much love and positive energy, to be able to be who you are without a worry of who judges you or who misunderstands you. It builds confidence, it builds resilience, it builds strength. It is so amazing to feel connected to a history feeling connected in the here and now, and at the same time feeling hopeful for the future. Does not everybody deserve to feel that way? And as if my tribe is not big enough, I've also been digging into my family history, my family tree. Some of the branches are taking me down to the 16th and 17th century. It's amazing what you learn about history by deep diving into your family history. You learn about the, my ans I've learned about my ancestors' resilience to cope with unspeakable hardships, generation after generation after generation. Things like poverty, devastation, disease, early child death, and even wartime migration. Did you know that over 250,000 Belgians found safety in the UK during the First World War? I didn't, not before I started doing my family tree. My aunt, sorry, my grandma and her sister at age 12 and 15 were among them. At these times when families were ripped apart, what became a theme throughout history was that strangers appeared to come together in communities to provide safety for the people who were lost. Today we see a very different type of migration, a migration of choice. We have the freedom to travel wherever we want to travel, to work wherever we want to work and to even retire to the other side of the world if we wanted to, in pursuit of a dream, an ambition, or in pursuit of a better quality of life. But does that not come at a cost? A few years back, I was faced with a decision. 
to stay in a job that had provided me with security for many a years, or to pursue my ambition and my dream of going self-employed and setting up my own business. I took the leap. I decided I was going to do it. Yes! Six months on, I was here. Have a read. All joking aside, I was lonely, I felt isolated, uncomfortable, depressed, and very emotional, with very few people to speak to. Every time somebody asked me how I was, I would break down in tears there and then. But I found solace. I found solace through technology. I found online communities of self-employed people or people who had started up a business. And I learned that actually what I was feeling was very normal. It was natural. It was part of a detoxing process, a growth process, to find myself and to find a new place for myself in the world after 20 plus years of being employed. It was really reassuring. I was very fortunate to find those groups online. That made me look into the impact of what it means to be lonely. It is amazing what I've learned through my own experience, how easy it is to get stuck in loneliness and depression, and to remove yourself from the world around you. At the time when I felt that way, I even broke up some friendships out of fear that they might judge me for some reason, for being too emotional, or for having made the wrong decisions. I looked into the research around loneliness, and the co-op British Red Cross found in their survey that over nine million people in the UK at any one time report to feel either always or often lonely. Research done by The Big Lunch, one of the Eden Project's initiatives, looked into the impact of these disconnected communities and found the cost of them to be £32 billion every single year. And obviously loneliness affects us all, but it affects certain groups more than others. Other research shows that 1.2 older people feel lonely always or often, any given day, and with half a million of them reporting that they may not see or speak to anybody for five to six days a week. The cost of following a dream could be disconnected communities. The cost of migration could be disconnected communities. A couple of years back, my husband and I moved into a new street. Now recognizing my need for social connection, I wanted to do something that helped me to feel connected to the community that I had just moved into. The street in which I've moved into is a cul-de-sac with about 50 houses and at the end a beautiful green. Looking at the green, I knew that that was the place where I wanted to meet most of my neighbours. So I went about designing, printing invitations and before I could change my mind, I put, posted them through the letterboxes of each person in the street. And then the doubt set in. What had I done? Don't be foolish. Who would come to a party that, where you don't even know who organized it? And then there was a knock on the door, a little bit of savior. An elderly lady had walked up 10,000 
10 houses up to my door just to let me know how much you enjoyed the idea and that she would buy some sausage rolls to share. With doubt still in my mind, I shared with her my concern that nobody might show up on the day, and she said, well, there's you, there's me, there's sausage rolls. Surely that makes for a good conversation. I'm sure she was right. So the day came. I'd set up a gazebo. I put some tables and chairs out, and I hung up some bunting just to set the scene. And out of the hundred-something people in my street, I figured 15 or 20 people would be a realistic number to expect. That first street party, 79 people showed up, all of them bringing food and drink to share. And as soon as I turned my back, more garden chairs and picnic blankets found their way onto the green. I was so overwhelmed still today. I felt recharged, rebooted, a very familiar feeling actually, but even more so because I had created something. Created for myself a solution to my own loneliness and my own feelings of social isolation. But it wasn't just about me. In the weeks to follow, I found the street had changed. People were saying hello to one another by name, were having conversations over garden fences. Children were playing together and friendships blossomed just by one event. Needless to say, we are now doing this every single year. This is the photos from the event a couple of weeks ago. Thankfully, the sunshine was with us. There's a few lessons that I would like to share with you, or that I must share with you. If, like me, you want to do something about your need for social connection, then these are four things I would advise. The first is start from where you are now. There is so much pressure on us to be more, to do more, to go further, to find things, to do whatever. It's pressure that others put on us, but it's also pressure that we put on ourselves. But if you start to feel what you feel and connect with what you feel, then that is a platform from which you can find the best solutions that suit you and suit others around you. The second is don't focus on time, focus on energy. Time is exhaustive, time ticks away, time can be wasted, it is an exhaustive measure. Energy, on the other hand, can be rebooted, can be recharged, and particularly when you spend time with people that really appreciate you, such as today's audience. The third starts with a quote by Helen Keller. A happy life consists not in the absence, but in the mastery of hardships. And that is something that I've learned from my ancestors. Life is tough. Life affects us. Throws things at us that we don't want, at the worst possible times, and we have to handle it. We can't control what comes our way, but we can control the way we respond to them. And that's where in happiness lies. It is in the mastery. It is in the resilience you create in dealing with hardships that we can't control. And the last one is celebrate and have fun. Sounds easy. It's not that easy to do. We're all very reserved, we don't celebrate. But celebration is the antidote to loneliness, I tell you now. Yes, I've shared some hard stories and some heart-wrenching statistics about loneliness, but that doesn't mean that the solution to 
loneliness has to be negative. Actually, the contrary is true. Celebration and fun is the antidote to loneliness. It distracts us. And yes, initially it feels like a distraction. But when we practice it, it becomes a habit, it becomes a routine, it becomes a discipline, and it changes your mindset. So if, like me, you understand your own need for connection, and if you consider yourself fortunate than some other people, then there has never, ever been a better time than to build taller, longer tables, not taller fences. Thank you.